for distinguished and outstanding service to Trinidad and Tobago in the sphere of public service, legal and judicial. Mr. Kelsick received the nation's highest honor while the constitutionality of an extension of his term of office was being challenged in court. San Fernando barrister Ramesh Maharaj contended that the constitution made it clear that the chief justice on attaining the age of 65 should vacate his office. The president of the republic, Mr. Ellis Clark, did not agree with that interpretation and allowed Mr. Kelsick to stay in office beyond his July 65th birthday. Justice Lennox de Alsing, in giving an interpretation of Section 65 of the Constitution, disagreed with the President, ruling that Mr. Kelsick was illegally in office. The Attorney General appealed, and at the Privy Council in London, it was ruled that the President was correct. On Monday, 23rd December, a new Chief Justice, Clinton Bernard, was sworn into office. <laughs> I, Clinton Bernard, having been appointed Chief Justice of Trinidad and Tobago, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, I will uphold the Constitution and the law, and I will conscientiously, impartially, and to the best of my knowledge, judgment, and ability, discharge the functions of my office and do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of Trinidad and Tobago, without fear or favor, affection or ill will. Ramesh Maharaj was also at the center of another legal matter. This time he found himself a defendant. The lawyer was arrested and charged along with an associate, Ken Sager, with attempting to pervert the natural course of justice. The charges followed a search of his office in San Fernando by the police and related to a matter involving a murder case. At year's end, the matter is still pending. In December, Maharaj was again in the news, this time burning the Constitution after the High Court gave a ruling which, in effect, cleared the way for the state to enter lands at Weimar for the purpose of highway development. At year's end, the legal battle for the occupation of the lands had ended. One final ruling is pending, after which the state will have the green light to enter and occupy the lands in order to complete the dueling of the Uriah Butler Highway between Chaguanas and the junction with the Churchill Roosevelt Highway. In December, the Uriah Highway became a waterway following the heaviest rains in decades. The rains cut off entire villages in central Trinidad with flood waters rising as much as six and seven feet in some areas. Villages marooned in their homes had to be airlifted to safety. And as the flood waters raced to the Gulf of Paria, the southbound carriageway and the Weimar bottleneck became flooded cutting off the flow of all traffic between North and South Trinidad for two days. Only the adventurous braved the surging flood waters and motorists camped in their vehicles on the northbound carriageway of the highway. The floods claimed one life. Ironically, it was not through drowning. The victim was in a car with a defective exhaust system. She died from carbon monoxide poisoning. The December floods caused the establishment of a flood relief action team under the chairmanship of Agriculture Minister Kamaluddin Mohammed. At year's end, the committee was still meeting. And even as the waters were receding, the Works Minister Hugh Francis announced that Cabinet had approved money for the continuation of the Carney River dredging project. Seven million dollars to complete a project which was started in 1985 to help prevent the annual floods in the central areas. In 1985, there was a marginal increase in crime, but most disturbing in the criminal activity was an increasing sophistication in the type of criminal activity and the use of weapons. Police statistics on crime in 1985 were not available at the time this report was being prepared. But one senior police officer told us that crime should not be judged on the basis of statistics alone, since this can give a perception of a situation that is entirely inaccurate. A parker just go and get that lady, start screaming. Miss your car going again. That's on fear. So it's on fear. I don't care if you kill me here. Yeah. I am leaving. I am leaving at all. This is my car. I know how to work for it. The motor vehicle wrecking crew was active in the city for most of the year in a bid to keep traffic flowing. 
With eight private wreckers on the job up to November 13 to have their contracts ended, 10,634 motorists had their vehicles towed away. The majority of the cases were because of parking violations. Some were for obstruction. The wreckers were not on the roads for Christmas because tenders are yet to be awarded for the renewal of the contracts. But the police traffic chief expects that the wreckers will be back on the roads early in the new year. At year's end, the road fatality figure stood at 216, two less than the 1984 figure. Included in the statistic was TTT's Emery Robley, killed on the spot as his car crashed through a bridge at Marival on Friday the 13th of September. It was a Black Friday indeed for all who knew Emery both on and off the television tube. He was an individual brimming over with charisma, with a friendly personality that was infectious. Emery was a dedicated journalist who believed in his profession, elevating it during his ten-year career to the highest levels of excellence. My colleagues and I are too pained to recount his final moments with us. But who are we to question the way of the Lord? And if we accept his passing as the way it had to be, then can we not feel too that Brother Rob is meaning to be teaching all of us a lesson? <laughs> Teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The world of journalism became poorer with Emery's passing, but his was not the only death to shock the nation in 1985. On July 13th, Ram Kerpalani's car crashed into a pillar under the Laventil flyover on the Beetham Highway. He died shortly afterwards at hospital. It was a major shock for the business community and indeed the nation as they learnt of his death. Mr. Ram was only one of the many business figures who died in 1985. Another prominent one was Bolan Amar, head of the Amar establishment. But it was Mr. Ram's death that really shook the nation and in a way symbolized the waning fortunes of the business community. Ram Kirpalani was a simple man whose vast empire contributed significantly to the welfare of the nation. And even in death, he remained simple as he was carried to the banks of the Karani River for the final Hindu rites and cremation. It was at this same site that the mortal remains of Panman Rudolf Charles was cremated. For more than two decades, Charles had devoted his life to the steel pan, improving it, giving it more scope, and broader dimensions. And when he died, his colleagues designed a casket out of the steel drum which had become so much a part of his life to carry him to his final destination. The world of dance lost Astor Johnson in 1985 and well-known band leader Harold Saldina also passed on. Somehow it seemed death stalked the nation in 1985 and in October this frightening speculation seemed real as 16 Trintock workers perished in an explosion on a barge. It happened at Point of Pier as the men were servicing the barge. The same day of the Trintock tragedy, chills of horror ran through the spines of hundreds of parents as their children were rushed to hospital, poisoned after drinking soft drinks. Fortunately, all survived. On three occasions in 1985, the national flag came down to half-mast to mourn the passing of prominent figures. First, it was Tom Adams, the Barbadian Prime Minister, who was felled by a massive heart attack. Then the Guyanese President Forbes Burnham. And in December, our High Commissioner to Canada, Basil Pitt, who died in office in Ottawa while recuperating from an illness 
that necessitated surgery. Former government minister John O'Halloran died in Canada after a prolonged illness. He was the center for controversy involving the acceptance of a bribe from a foreign company to build the Kearney Racing Complex. Just before his death, he told a journalist that he accepted the bribe not for himself, but for his party. The opposition in Trinidad and Tobago had always called for O'Halloran's extradition to Trinidad for trial on corruption charges. And it was after his death that the Attorney General told the Parliament that to bring him to trial would have been a futile exercise since witnesses had said they would not testify in such a trial. The integrity of the police came into question in 1985 over its handling of the murder of a citizen while he was in their custody. Abdul Karim, a member of the Muslimin sect, was stabbed to death by an assailant while he was under arrest. An inquest into the murder attracted widespread public attention. The inquest ended with no evidence to involve the police in the murder, and the matter was referred back to the police commissioner for further investigation. At year's end, no further developments had taken place in the Karim matter. Abdul Karim's death threw the spotlight for the second time in 1985 on the Muslimin organization and their leader, Imam Abu Bakr. The Imam, it was alleged, had gone ahead without the proper authority to build a mosque on lands at Mukarapu, owned by the city council. The Imam refused a court order to demolish the building, saying that the Islamic law which he followed was bigger than the law of the land. He eventually served a 21-day sentence for contempt of court. But at year's end, the mosque is still standing at Mukarapu.